In Plant Life Histories, we'll talk about things like optimal seed size. Seeds might be either too small to survive if the seedling that results is too small to get established, or if they're too large, maybe they won't be able to be dispersed away from the plant or fit into the mouth of the seed-eating seed disperser. But the optimal size survives the best, and the optimum is where the seed size size curve meets that line. But before we talk about details of seeds and seedlings and seed dispersal, let's look at life history of a plant. Remember from ecology that the life history is basically the schedule of an organism's life, how old they have to be before they reproduce, the number of times they reproduce during their lives, how they allocate energy to reproduction, how many and how big are the offspring that they have, and then how long does the individual live. Also from ecology, you can remember that fitness depends on producing successful offspring. So most all life history attributes relate to that important thing all organisms must do, reproduce. Maturity, parity, fecundity and aging are all components of fitness. So like any organism, the perfect plant would be one that could begin reproducing at birth and reproduce forever because it would live forever. But there are no plants like this. I know we've just talked about vegetative reproduction and in a way a single genotype may perpetuate, but an individual normally does not live forever, reproducing sexually forever. There are two extremes in life history and many good plant examples of each. One is semi-parity, that is reproducing only once in one's lifetime, putting everything into that reproductive event. So this is called Big Bang reproduction, like the fish salmon do and many plants like bamboo and agaves, also known as century plants, as well as annual plants. Then the other option is to be iteroparous. And these are organisms that reproduce repeatedly during their life cycle. More organisms are like this, and more plants too. There are terms that botanists use for these two things. Semilparis is normally called monocarpic. And a monocarpic plant is one that reproduces once at maturity and then dies. Here's an agave that's just given its all to make a huge inflorescence using over 75% of its biomass. A polycarpic plant is iteroparis reproducing at maturity, then usually living to reproduce potentially many times during its life, like the violets shown here under story perennial plants. There are other terms we use in botany or plant ecology for life history strategies, the annuals that grow up, reproduce, and die within the space of a year. Perennials are those that grow up, reproduce, and then survive to reproduce the next year and the year after it until they die. The term biennial is used especially among gardeners for plants that need two years to reach maturity. They grow up over a two-year period, reproduce, and then they die or are harvested like the biennial beets. Lastly are semilparous perennials, which might live many years before flowering, but then die after flowering, like many, like some rainforest trees that may live 80 or 100 or more years, growing bigger and bigger and then flowering, dying and falling over. So life histories can vary among species in a given place or in a family or group of plants, but also within a species there it can be differences 
among populations in different places. And life histories may vary because of either the influence of environmental conditions or inherited patterns of reproductive biology, or a combination of the two. Some life history traits are usually found together, such as slow development, delayed sexual maturity, low reproductive rate, and high parental investment. An e plant example would be a big oak tree, an animal, an elephant. On the other extreme are those organisms that develop quickly and reach sexual maturity quickly. They have a high reproductive rate and low parental investment per offspring, such as insects and weedy plants, the pictures shown here. In general, for organisms, here's a plot of annual mortality rate plotted on the x-axis and annual fecundity, or the amount of reproduction, on the y-axis. And fecundity is correlated, directly correlated with mortality. The more organisms reproduce, the more offspring they have, the bigger the offspring, the more likely they are to die sooner than organisms that have less invested in reproduction. So life history theory is based on the assumption that an optimal allocation of resources exists given the constraints of the physiology of the organism the optimum that will maximize population growth rate for that species. That's because resources are limited and have to be allocated proportionally to different life functions, especially growth and maintenance versus reproduction. So optimal resource allocation would be the best given the constraints of that organism's physiology and the environment, where as maximal is the best without regard to constraints. So optimal reproduction or fecundity would be the highest that could be sustained over a few years, whereas maximal fecundity might be probably would be higher, but might lead to the death of the organism. The key question is which leads to the highest rate of increase, little r, of the population. And this results in trade-offs organisms make in an evolutionary sense because they have to allocate resources that are limited. And it's true that resources used for one thing can't be used for another. If the resource allocation is altered, usually it affects the fitness of the organism. And this is because increase in one function leads to decrease in another. For example, organisms that reproduce at a very early age usually are relatively small in their adult size. So they have less re resources to put into reproduction. Another example is that having more offspring means a lower chance that all of those offspring will survive. Usually this is because those offspring are smaller or less well taken care of or whatever, given fewer provisions. For anyone who has fruit trees, you know that when a plant first starts to flower and reproduce, the fruit crop is very small. Here's a guy with a mango in a pot and its first mango. But when a tree is big and mature, the crop can be much, much larger. Semilparous plants, also known as monocarpic plants, give their all to reproduction and then they die. And to the right is the agave with a huge inflorescence. And to the left, the spiky, hairy-looking spikes are plants that are monocarpic in the Andes. They're in the Lobeliaceae. 
So one of the classic ways of looking at organisms is using R and K selection theory, little r for the reproductive rate, K for the carrying capacity of the environment. Species that are K selected are those for which density dependent factors are more important. Those that are R selected have density independent factors more important. So basically R versus K is density independent population regulation versus density dependent population regulation. And the generalizations of R and K selection are those which we talked about before, the traits that are often correlated with one another. Organisms that develop rapidly, mature early, at a small size, with a short lifespan, may also be semiparous and colonize open habitats. These are species that are said to be R selected. At the other extreme, those more subject to density dependent factors, they develop slowly, have delayed maturation at a large size, live a long time, reproduce many times, and are successful in closed habitats. These are K selected species. This theory has fallen out of fashion in the field of ecology because it can't be explained by natural selection. You can't really select for the carrying capacity as it's a property of the environment, not the organisms. But also, people have classified one organisms as one or the other when really all organisms are arranged along a continuum. The English ecologist J.P. Grime thought of plant life histories having an additional dimension. Instead of two extremes, R and K, he envisioned three extremes. Those that tolerate stress, those that are occupied disturbed habitats, ruderals they were called by him, and competitors, those that are favored by increasing resources and stability. So similar to RK theory, the continuum, but a triangle this time, with competitive ability, maybe being a little more like K selected species, little r colonizing ability like R selected species, but very important for plants, S selected species, those that are stress tolerant. And why this is important for plants is that plants usually can't move, so they have to take the environment where they are established. So a single plant species could be placed anywhere within this continuum, this triangular continuum. And if we see these red dots as different species, they're the ones that are in this stress area are probably those living in the driest deserts, the highest mountain tops, etc. So here's the green triangle with a species indicated in terms of its position on the, the different continua. And if we look at groups of organisms, they fall into similar places. The annual herbs tend to be near the R corner of the triangle. Biennial herbs a little more toward the middle. Perennial herbs and ferns all over the triangle. Bryophytes down at the bottom. Uh, perennial and stress tolerant and lichens at the opposite end of annual herbs because they are quite good at tolerating stress. Because remember, lichens are that symbiotic association where either partner couldn't exist in a stressful place, but together they can survive. <laughs>